Okay, so the spot where we're standing is not the best, not representative of this field, but we had some problems last fall with establishment. It was so dry through September and well into October that nothing germinated. Mm. And then when the rain finally came, it was so late that it didn't have a good start. But on top of that, when it finally started to rain, this area got flooded by rain from the highway road ditch that had not been maintained. And that caused us additional uh, destruction. So here we are with not very much. Uh, in a situation like this, we're going to have a weed issue. Now, obviously this is just a small spot and a lot of the field is better, but we've got another issue coming up and it's much more worrisome than the weeds and that's because it's dry. And everybody is reporting on how rapidly the soil is drying out. Temperatures are running about 10 degrees above the forecast for the last several days. Uh, there was an inch of rain in the forecast for the end of this week, last week, but now it's down to a few tenths and it's down to one and a half days instead of four days. So this is kind of a pattern that we're used to. Uh, climate change has turned us into much more of a Mediterranean climate. And in a Mediterranean climate, when the rain stops, it kind of stops. And we've been in this kind of a pattern for several years here now. So with the grain at this stage, we're actually better off taking it for forage and either no-tilling after taking it for forage, no-tilling the, the beans into it, or going, going ahead and doing some tillage and then planting our beans. And the reason is, this, uh, even though it doesn't look like there's much here, it continues to use water. And after crimping, uh, there, is, there can be a substantial loss of water in these crimped uh, cover crop systems. So we're, we're having to deal with this in an adaptive management. And adaptive management doesn't say you go with the plan no matter what happens. It says we look at what's happened, we look at the forecast, we look at what our risks are, and then we decide where, how are we going to make the best of it. Uh, another factor when we have these dry springs and this early spring drought is forage, generally forage yields are depressed. And when forage yields are depressed, the value of these cover crops suddenly goes way up mm. as a forage. And if you're feeding cows tree to Kaley and you cut it at the boot stage, which this would be this in about a week, it's literally rocket fuel if you're trying to make milk. Uh, it's really high quality forage. So when you have extra high quality forage in a year when forage is short, suddenly we're, uh, the opportunity cost of not harvesting the forage goes way up. So in this particular spot, you know, obviously there's some reasons that things went wrong, but we would have a very strong motivation here to harvest this as a forage and then either no-till into the field afterwards or do tillage, but to not let this cover crop uh, be lost because it has such a high value today. So our decision point whether to do tillage after taking the forage is actually how much we see in the way of weeds weed potential. So a lot of these small, recently germinated weeds, if we're crimping, they're not an issue. If we were to go through and shred this and, and make a mulch out of it, they might not be an issue. But if we remove them, they suddenly get sunlight. And that, that would be my determination. I'm really looking forward to the day when we have a material like Harpy, which they tell us is going to be allowed for organic. And two years in a row now, they told us there was going to be some available for us to experiment with. And two years in a row, they said, sorry, we don't have any now. But if we could be uh, terminating the crop in that way, we would stop our water loss. The standing triticale then would actually lower soil temperature and prevent that, uh, prevent drying out and help save water. At that point, the decision to go with, to stay with no-till would just be let's terminate the crop a little earlier, plant the crop a little earlier, or terminate the cover crop earlier, plant the beans earlier, and then go with that. And that would be our adaptive management in that case. But we don't have that tool today. So between not having the ability to terminate this crop early and use it as an, ad, as an advantage in saving water, and the fact that the forage is going to carry an extra value this year, uh, this will probably just be harvested and then uh, unfortunately conventionally tilled to grow 
crop. Uh, that said, last year where we had to do this, we saw some 80 bushel soybeans. Mm. And if you take off a crop that has a high forage value and then get 80 bushel soybeans, you laugh all the way to the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is we really need to be proactively dealing with the erosion factor. And of course, when we're dry in the spring, that's not a very big risk. But we're not always going to be that way. And with climate change, we're getting both extremes. So in a wet year, the adaptive management would be to say, get this planted when the crop, when the soybeans ought to be planted, terminate the, the cover crop when it's time to terminate the cover crop, and then be glad that it's using water because it'll help dry the ground back out when we're waterlogged and, and too wet. And in those conditions, leaving the cover crop, first of all, forage uh, prices are low, so the value of harvesting is less. The feeding value of that crop is less when you have a lot of rain and it grows real heavy. But the benefit that it gives your crop is way up because then it helps dry the ground out at a time when the soil would actually be running excessive moisture and hurting our seedlings. Uh, additional benefit here, we have a lot of deer damage. And what we've learned is the beards on both rye and triticale uh, are irritate deer. So when the deer come in and want to forage on our rapidly emerging soybeans, they get their faces poked and it really frustrates them and we don't have anywhere near the crop loss. <laughs> so there are benefits to no-till that go far beyond just the obvious agronomic ones. I think we really need to learn why is it we're tilling? That's an important question. And if we can't answer that question with a positive saying we're tilling for something that we need here, then we shouldn't be tilling. Uh, on the other hand, there are some cases where the benefits of tillage line up with what's needed in that case, and in that case we would opt to do a, not more tillage than we need, but at least enough tillage to get the maximum production in that situation. I can recall several years when mm -hmm. it was excessively wet, and the first thing that we saw was that the water pouring out of the other end of the field was clean. Uh, the other thing we noticed is we could walk out in that field and not have muddy boots, even a day after the rain. But uh, those, the wet spots, when we did that, it really didn't, uh, the crop wasn't suffering. We didn't have that sealing over. You know, when we use tillage and we get a heavy rain, the soil tends to seal over. It doesn't have much oxygen. It's a condition, it's an anaerobic condition that is really rough on the crop. Now in that case, the the crimped rye was pumping water out and actually letting, helping air back in. It was like a thousand little snorkels putting oxygen back in the soil, feeding our aerobic soil life and keeping things going. You know, in that case, if we had done tillage, it would have been a very expensive waste of fuel that would have ended up producing a lower yield. So that, that's another example of looking at our situation and keeping in mind why would we tell if we if one of the reasons that we would tell or several of the reasons that we would tell don't exist then we should be asking why are we thinking about doing something that's that expensive i guess the other thing we're seeing here um and again we're not in the best spot to really see it is when we have austrian winter peas together with a grass crop like triticale like uh, rye or wheat we're noticing that in the spots where there's plenty of nitrogen and rapid growth, the Austrian winter peas are hardly to be seen. But in the spots where it's too wet so that the nitrogen denitrifies or whether the, uh, where the grain is not growing real well, the Austrian winter peas will be there in bigger, apparently bigger numbers. I think it's all impression, you know, where it's relative size, not number of plants. But these spots that are smaller, if you give them a little more time, those Austrian winter peas will suddenly uh, explode. And I've seen years when the spots where the rye and the triticale were not as good suddenly were the heaviest yielding and the, the most heavily shaded spots in the field because the winter peas came on just a little bit later and suddenly produced a beautiful dense cover where there wouldn't have been one if we'd been using a single species. Also, the Austrian winter peas are really easy to terminate. Mm. I chose uh, triticalean pea instead of cereal rye here, uh, partly because that it was what we had. 
But uh, the other reason is we're noticing that the triticale is a, it's a little later, and that gives us an option here where if we wanted to do uh, dry beans, that would have been ready to terminate at about the right stage for dry beans. And I think we're, we need to stop thinking of organic no-till as only crimped rye planted to soybeans. We've got a lot of other species. We've got a lot of other opportunities. And obviously the work that's been done with the winter killed covers and the spring grains being no-tilled is, is showing that in some, especially in a spring like this, when our climate is very much Mediterranean and we're running out of water, that winter killed cover is saving water and is pr producing an environment where we're going to have a much better yield by no-till than if we weren't doing it. And it's, it's a completely different use of the, the principles. And we're, this is an example of where Cornell Research is running ahead of what farmers are doing and is showing us a way that we can adapt to a changing climate that's less and less predictable, but also uh, more harsh than what we're used to. Got uh, one more use of no-till, mm -hmm. and this is one that I hope you start doing research on. Crops that are damaged by wind, and we've had several years that we had snow cover and our uh, winter lentils did fine. This year the winter lentils got burned, and it's because we had zero snow cover and we had a couple of events when the temperature dropped 50 degrees in a matter of 24 hours and the winds went to 40 miles an hour and we had frozen soil, no snow, desiccation, and there was a lot of damage to the lentils. If they had been no-tilled into a crop that left a stiff stubble, that stiff stubble would have blocked a lot of the wind, would have given protection, would have caught more snow when there was some snow to catch, and it also would have created a little bubble of warmer air right next to the soil. So when, when we start asking all these questions about why are we tilling, or what are the benefits versus downsides of tillage, one of the downsides of tillage in the fall is that in some cases we've got a protective cover that would really help our crop do better over winter that tillage destroys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not to mention it costs money. <laughs>